<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Today is Monday, October 24th, and this is the regularly scheduled 5 p.m. meeting of the Housing Authority of the County of Monterey. Um, Debbie, could you please take the roll? Yes, uh, Chair John Wizard. Here. Vice Chair Hans Buter. Uh, present. Commissioner Kevin Healy. Commissioner Kathleen Ballesteros. Present. Commissioner Viviana Gama. Present. Commissioner Francine Goodwin. Present. We have a quorum. Great, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Ballesteros, if I ask you to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, um, I don't know why, so can you guys, I don't know, you guys can't see me, but I can't see nothing, my phone's acting up, but I'll do it. <laughs> we we can see you, just uh, oh. in case you want to take, take care of any personal matters, your video is on. <laughs> okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America mm -hmm. and to the Republic for mm -hmm. which it stands, divisible with liberty and justice for all. I think I forgot something. <laughs> oh, I thought it was just a technical glitch, but uh, thank you very right. much. I appreciate the help. Thank you. Uh, and we'll move to item number three, comments from the public. Any member of the public joining us this evening, uh, virtually or uh, in the office, please uh, either raise your hand or make yourself known so that we can hear your comments. Comments are limited to three minutes and are on topics not agendized elsewhere in the, gen in the agenda. If you'd like to make a comment on something on the agenda, you can do so at that time when we get to the agenda item. Uh, any members of the public wishing to make public comment, please let us know. I don't see anybody with their hand up. Um, Gabby, is there anybody on the phone? I don't see anyone. Okay, um, we'll move the agenda, but um, if necessary, we'll come back to the public comment if someone comes in a couple of minutes late. Um, we'll now move to item four, a presentation to Myra Macias for her many years of service. Yes, um, so Myra Macias, uh, the certificate says 20 years, the agenda says, oh, the certificate has been changed, yay. So uh, for 10 years of loyal service, um, and I do not know if Myra was able to join us on the phone, but we want to congratulate her uh, and give her the certificate. Great, thank you. I am not seeing anybody with their hand up. Um, so it doesn't look like she's joined us this evening, but um, you know, we can never gush about our incredible employees enough. Um, really, this whole operation only works because of them. So. Uh, we remain ever thankful, especially you know, as board members who only have a little bit of interaction uh, with daily operations, uh, just for all of the hard work and good work that they do. So thank you everybody for, for continuing to help serve the, the many families in Monterey County. Uh, we'll next move to item five, the consent agenda. Uh, consists of items A, B, and C. Item 5A is resolution 3070 for uh, the continuance of Assembly Bill 361 for remote meetings. Item 5B is the minutes of the regular board meeting from September 26, 2022. And item C is the special board meeting from September 16th, 2022. Um, is there any commissioner question related to the consent agenda this evening? No. Commissioner Goodwin, did I hear something? No. Okay, um, we'll go out to the public. Is any member of the public uh wishing to poll or comment on item 5a 5b or 5c on our consent agenda if so please either call out uh, so we don't miss you or raise your hand or otherwise make yourself known okay hearing and seeing no one we'll close public comment and come back to uh the board or actually we'll close the uh the public's ability to, to pull an item will come back to the board. Are there any comments or recommendations from the board? I make a motion to approve. I second that. It's been properly moved by Commissioner Ballesteros and seconded by Commissioner Booter. Uh, we'll go back out for public comment on the action. 
Uh, any member of the public wishing to uh, comment on the board's desire to approve the consent agenda? Item 5A, the resolution 3070. Item 5B, the minutes from September 26th. Or item C, the special board meeting minutes from September 16th. Hearing and seeing no one, we'll close public comment on the motion and come back to the board. It's been moved and seconded. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Uh, Commissioner Wizard. Aye. Commissioner Booter. Yes. Commissioner Healy. Commissioner Ballesteros. Yes. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next on to the reports of committees. Commissioner Ballesteros, any news from the personnel committee? Um, yes, we did have a meeting and um, everything is under new business. Wonderful, thank you very much for your succinct report. Commissioner Gama, any reports from finance and development? We did meet this meet uh, this month and also it's in, under the new business. Wonderful, I appreciate your uh, concise report. Thank you very much. Um, and on to Michi and Michi AA. Uh, if memory serves, we, uh, Made a, I made a report in the last meeting. I don't know that we've had a, another meeting since. Does that sound right to you, Tori? Yes. Okay, so no, nothing to report. Uh, that concludes the reports of committees and we'll next move to item seven, the report of the secretary, Mr. Executive Director. Uh, so uh, attended a number of meetings, uh, including the, the CHISPA uh, board meeting. Um, myself and uh, several other members of staff attended a virtual roundtable that HUD hosted on EHV strategies uh, with all of the California agencies that run an EHV program. And uh, we came up with uh, some good ideas uh, that other people were using. Um, and I think one of the things that we are going to be changing is the amount of our uh, incentive fee that we were currently offering landlords. Um, a number of communities had much larger incentive fees that, than we had, and it seemed like it was helping them. Um, and I'll let Maria talk more about that in her report. Um, I signed a settlement uh, to settle the unfair labor practice that had been filed by the SEIU. Um, it's making its way through other signatures, but I am uh, expecting that that unfair labor practice will be settled. Uh, Michi has vacated the office uh, 303 Front Street. Um, we applied for more vouchers. It's a new type of voucher called the Stability Voucher from HUD. Uh, the Stability Voucher is basically like an EHV voucher, except without all the extra service dollars and veterans are now an eligible service population. But other than that, it would basically operate like EHV. Um, and then finally uh, have executed, I don't know how many, I don't know if Carolina knows how many, many loan modifications um, relating to the change from LIBOR to so far. Um, and uh, if you aren't up to speed on that, there has been a shift uh, from banks uh, using LIBOR and now they're using the secured overnight financing rate. Um, and, uh, most of the banks stopped using LIBOR uh, with any new transactions uh, at the beginning, at the end of 21 or beginning of 22. Um, and during 2022, they've been updating all of the loan documents. Um, so I have been visiting the notary many times. Um, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from commissioners? I have a question, um, Chair Wizard. Yeah, go um, ahead. On the settlement, um, Tori, that was signed, do you know, is it a uh, confidential settlement? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's confidential settlement or not. Um, uh, at this point, I don't know that the other party has signed it. I have not received confirmation of that oh, yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, no, I just noted that um, someone named Julio seems to have his hand up and has had his hand up for a bit. 
Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chair. I didn't see that. Um, Julio, are you, um, could you let us know under what agenda item you'd like to make this comment? Yes, good afternoon, uh, board members. Uh, my name is Julio Hernandez. I'm an eligibility specialist. Uh, I'm also uh, a steward for the union, to, and um, I, I chimed in a little bit late. Um, I wanted to give a comment um, in the public uh, comments section. I just didn't get a chance to. to sure, to... Give, me, give me just a second. Um, and so just for clarity for the public, we're going to um, take Julio's comment under public comment, but because it's virtual and we move the agenda pretty quickly, um, we're going to go back to public comment to facilitate hearing Julio's comment. So we'll just sort of you know, pause where we're at in the agenda so we can do that. Uh, Julio, please go ahead. You have a three minute period for your comments. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, well, good afternoon, uh, everybody from the board. I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to listen to my comment. I uh, I just wanted to take the time as a union steward and also as an employee to uh, give thanks, especially to uh, everybody who has been, um, you know, uh, helping us out in situations that we had with the union. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of progress there going on. Uh, I want to thank Tori and, of course, uh, the person I really want to focus on is uh, James. I think he's done an incredible job so far. Um, uh, we have talked about uh, among ourselves when the union uh, reps and the swords, and uh, we want to say thank you to him because he's been very helpful. Uh, I know he's been here a short time, and he has been accomplishing a lot of things that were pretty for a long time. We just want to give him his support because, um, you know, he has been instrumental in making sure that, you know, a lot of us are, uh, you know, catching up with some of the things that were pending. And also to Tori because, you know, he has facilitated a lot of those things also. And I think it's important that you guys hear this as a board because, you know, uh, I think that we need to participate a little bit more as employees uh, in these board meetings so that you guys are aware of what's, you know, how, how we feel about things and how things are going on. And more than anything, just to improve the, a better relationship, working relationship and environment within our company. I think this company has a, this agency has a great uh, future. And of course, uh, more than anything, we want to be able to uh, cooperate with each other and work together and uh, thank you guys for giving us the support that we need and just just wanted to say that and, and make it a comment because i think it's it's ne it's needed uh sometimes you know in order for us to continue going forward knowing that the things that we're doing are working and uh, they're making progress that's it thank you thank you very much for that comment julio i appreciate it and we always love uh, hearing positive things and uh of course we are prepared to hear negative ones, but we're always so thrilled to hear about uh, positive relationships between our members of staff and our labor groups and that everybody is uh, all aligned with the mission of helping the, the residents. Uh, and we're both on the same sheet of music. So again, appreciate your comments and uh, thank you for your patience as we uh, rework the agenda to facilitate you making those comments. Um, I will now, um, seeing no other hands raised uh, for that public comment, um, uh, revisiting public comment, I'll move back to where we were in the agenda, uh, which is closed session. So just for the benefit of the public, we anticipate um, discussing an item 9A, a, uh, an offer of employment to a potential executive, new executive director. But before we're prepared to do that, we want to um, tie up some loose ends and make sure that we're all uh, set with the negotiation back and forth with that candidate. So we're going to have a brief closed session just to dot the I's and cross the T's. Uh, and once we get out, you will know the benefit of what we discussed through our actions and conversation in item 9A. So at this time, um, I'm uh, going to ask uh, our clerk to facilitate um, uh, closing off the room. Yeah, Go I ahead. think we want to move people into the waiting room. Yeah, so we're going to move uh, you into the waiting room and then lock the meeting, have our closed session, and we'll bring you all back in. So there's no need to log off. There's no need to hunt for the leak to come right back. You just hang out for a little bit in the waiting room and you'll be automatically brought back into the meeting. Thank you all for your patience. We've concluded the closed session. Um, and I apologize. I should have read us in more formally. The closed session was related to government code section 54597 to discuss personnel matters, specifically the uh, potential offer of employment to the executive director candidate. Uh, that is what we discussed. No formal votes were taken. However, we will discuss that same exact thing now in open session as we 
returned from the closed section, again, to read us out, it was government code section 54597 to discuss personnel matters. Uh, we are discussing that now under item 9A, which is resolution 3071, uh, the offer of employment to executive director candidate. Uh, Tori, is this you? Yes, uh, so we've been going through a national search uh, for some time. Uh, the board, uh, the full board, uh, also uh, two county supervisors uh, met with a number of candidates. Um, and at last month's board meeting, I was authorized to make a job offer to Zulika Boykin uh, and negotiate uh, an employment, uh, the terms of employment and a contract. Uh, we have been doing that and um, we now have a, a contract um, and uh, should the board vote to approve and the contract is executed, uh, she's prepared to start at, at Hackham on December 5th. Very good. Thank you so much. Any questions from board members? Yeah. Okay. Seeing none, we'll go out to the public. Uh, any members of the public wishing to comment on the uh, resolution before us, which is to authorize me uh, to enter into a contract on behalf of the board with uh, Ms. Boykin to bring her on as the executive director? I don't see anyone or hear anyone. So I'll close public comment and come back to the board for comments or action. Would any of the board members like to uh, recommend any particular action or discuss anything related to the contract? I would like to make a motion to authorize um, the ch um, chair wizard to offer of employment to an executive director candidate. I'll second that. Okay, it's been properly moved by Commissioner Ballesteros and seconded by Vice Chair Booter to uh, approve resolution 3071 to authorize me to offer employment to Ms. Boykin as the executive director beginning December 5th, 2022. Um, just quickly on the second for the benefit of the public, um, we will make the contract um, available um, now that it's no longer in draft form after we finalized it before she signs it, because um, we wouldn't ask anybody to sign a draft document. We will make that uh, document available to the public if anybody's interested in looking at it. And uh, we did discuss a handful of minor changes, um, mostly grammatical and clarifying, uh, adding a word, deleting a word, um, but the structure of the contract remains intact. And um, uh, Commissioner Ballesteros, Vice Chair Booter, do I understand um, that you are uh, in agreement with those you know, one or two word additions or deletions to clarify the contract as we earlier discussed? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, it's been moved and seconded. Do I have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Wizard. Aye. Commissioner Booter. Yes. Commissioner Healy. Commissioner Ballesteros. Yes. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Motion carries. Wonderful. Uh, unanimously, we have approved to bring a new executive director and uh, while it pains me to say goodbye to Tori because of the wonderful work that he has done, uh, some of which is recorded as agenda items here in this very meeting, um, uh, it is uh, very important that we bring in um, you know, the stability of a permanent executive director who staff and the public and our partners can count on for uh, a good long while and have that uh, reassurance that they're not going anywhere soon. Um, We'll move to item 9B, resolution 3072, uh, authorization to enter into a contract with the California State Employment Development Department. So uh, commissioners, normally uh, I would not bring a contract of this amount to the board. Uh, it's a small contract, less than $25,000. Uh, however, EDD requires board approval to enter into a contract with them. 
Uh, and this is basically a contract uh, that provides uh, information to the housing authority. We provide them with social security numbers and they match that to their databases and, and provide us uh, with wage and unemployment and disability claims, uh, as well as uh, the information that they have on uh, both the client address and employment addresses. Um, so I've attached uh, the contract for your review uh, and would uh, urge its adoption. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any questions from board members? Okay, hearing and seeing none, I'll go out to the public. Is there any member of the public wishing to comment on item 9B, the resolution uh, 3072 to contract with the State Employment Development Department? Hearing and seeing none, we'll close public comment on item 9B and return to the board for uh, comments and action. Uh, I move approval. I'll second it. It's been properly moved by Vice Chair Booter and seconded by Commissioner Goodwin to adopt resolution 3072 to authorize uh, the agency to enter into a contract with EDD. Uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Wizard. Aye. Commissioner Booter. Yes. Commissioner Healy. Commissioner Ballesteros. Yes. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Tori. And then again, uh, with the chair's prerogative, I'll return to public comment um, from earlier in the meeting. That's item three. Uh, and I see that we have a caller whose phone number ends in 5557. Uh, it's been brought to my attention that that person wishes to make some public comments. Um, Gabby, is it star nine to unmute? Um, I'm not sure. Viviana, do you know which? Do you know which buttons to press to unmute when you call in? It's star six. Star six. Thank you so much. Uh, caller hello? number five five. Hi, hello. Please just give Hi. me a second. Um, oh. I would love to hear your comments. However, I just want to set some ground rules in case you're unfamiliar with the process. We allow people to give us comments uh, for three minutes, and it has to be on something that's not on the agenda. Otherwise, the comment goes under that particular agenda item. Uh, if that meets uh, your expectations for what you would like to share with us tonight, by all means, please go ahead. Okay, I think I think I I think I make the make the cut. Okay, go ahead. Okay, my name is Netta Joy Lantini, and I am an IHSS worker at 800 Cash Casanova. I have been for a um, little over a year. I've had three different clients, so I've been around the building quite a bit. And something that keeps coming up consistently is, this sounds like it might be out of the blue, but honestly, it's, it's happening so very consistently is something happens where um, a tenant has to leave real quickly, whether it's uh, they're hospitalized, uh, of course, there's death. Um, but the ones I'm speaking of more, um, more predominantly are, uh, example, lady that I was going to be taking care of she went to the hospital for, something came up she went to the hospital as it turns out she's not coming home so her family is way far away thus she has no clothing she's at a new place being treated with none of her clothes so us girls gathered up all their clothes washed them got them put into outfits got her name put on each of them got a hold of her of her next to Ken who's kind of guiding us through what she needs, got a hold of her social worker, and we'll be getting those things to her, which sounds like a, you know, singular episode, but it's happening more and more. Another lady um, has a brain tumor and she's been doing okay, but it just escalated. Her sister had to come get her to move in in Florida. She had to leave so fast. She basically has her dog, some of her clothes. So we've been in with the maintenance man 
sorting out everything as best we could, getting things to St. Vincent, ready for St. Vincent de Paul. They're coming for a big truckload, working with the man who throws out the things that are, you know, going to be rubbish or whatever, trying to get things placed um, where, you know, for people who have no furniture in the building, et cetera. And it started occurring to me, there's, and there's a few more cases. I don't want, I only have three minutes. There's a need and I'm not sure how to fill it, but I would like to draw something up and submit it to you all within the next few weeks of an idea of how to kind of be a mediator there between everything that has to take place in the building, the relatives, and the person who's had the emergency. Hello? I just wanted to make sure I didn't cut you off because you still had a little bit of time left and I don't want to eat into your, oh, I do. I, your I, period to tell us things. I don't think things. I have it. Yeah, I don't about, want to tell you too many stories. <laughs> well, you have about 15 seconds if there was a final thing you wanted to say. I'm just thinking that I should write up some ideas and submit them to you for discussion. Yeah, it would be really good if um, you, uh, Gabby, could you record her phone number? And then, um, um, Tori, would you be able to facilitate someone reaching out to her and um, giving her the right email or a time to talk in person or over the phone so that we can uh, work through this issue and see what kind of resolution we could come to? Sure. Yeah, and what was All your right. name again? Um, it's, I'll spell it for you. It's a little difficult. It's E D T A J O Y. And my last name is Lentini. L E N T I N I. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for your public comments. And I appreciate your patience with us. I understand that um, you know, our meeting starts promptly at five. And if you are not here for that 20 or 30 second window when we have public comment, um, you know, the meeting keeps moving. And so it's hard to, you know, grab that. And so well, I appreciate what happened was, I, I was there, but I didn't know how to unmute myself. I was, okay, I, I, yeah, so I that's, I was unmuting, it wasn't working. So that's why <laughs> we, uh, just for the, the public and for the board, that's why we, we go back sometimes if, if we skip someone, just because we want to make sure that we're providing the opportunity for public comment, but still, you know, moving the agenda at a good speed so that we're not having minutes of downtime where we wait for someone to pop in. So thank you everybody for your yeah, patience as we yeah. facilitate the virtual meetings and thank you ma'am for your comments and um, okay, uh, staff will follow up with you soon. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Have a good rest of the evening. And now we'll return yeah. to the, thank you, to the um, uh, regular order of the agenda. Um, we concluded item 9B and we'll move now to item 9C, resolution 3073, consideration of administrative plan chapter four, applications, waiting list, and tenant selection changes. Tori, take it away. Sure, so let me start with a little bit of background. Uh, one, um, our most recent audit found uh, that we were not complying with uniform guidance in maintaining a waiting list. Uh, and, and what that means is um, the system was complicated and it wasn't following what was being written down. Um, and the system is quite complicated, um, and I think it's having an adverse impact. And I think uh, Maria can certainly speak to this more, but you know, we recently called in uh, 700 people from the waiting list, and most of them um, had checked off preferences uh, when they applied that they weren't eligible for. Um, and then what happens is staff is spending all of its time verifying preferences and then removing the preferences, which then makes the person go farther back on the waiting list. So all the work that had been done on that person uh, was for nothing other than properly maintaining the waiting list and then putting the person farther down on the waiting list. And then we interplay that with, we have this homeless set aside preference, which I think is a, a great thing. Um, but we had kept that preference waiting list open. So somebody who had uh, the set aside homeless preference, they could apply at any time during the year. Everybody else could only apply when the waiting list was open once every several years for two weeks. And as a result of that, 89% uh, of the vouchers that were issued in the past year 
went to people with the set aside homeless preference. Um, and I think when the board created that preference, that wasn't the intention that we are only serving or mainly serving that population. Um, and so I've uh, circulated um, a uh, track changes version um, and uh, am recommending a number of changes um, and they're outlined in the memo and I'm happy to talk um, further in detail about them, but I'll, I'll stop my comments here because we still have a, a bunch of things on the agenda to get through. Okay, I, thank you. Yeah, yeah or go I can ahead. Talk more. <laughs> or I can talk uh, more if folks want. Well, more let's, let's <laughs> pause here for a second and see if any commissioners have questions. This is a pretty meaty topic and there is a lot of technical information. So um, I think this is a good place to take a break to see if there are any uh, interim questions. Yeah, Tori, one question I had was, um, what's the interplay here with the EHB program? So the emergency housing vouchers, which are kind of geared towards folks experiencing homelessness, like yeah, so there's thing up. So those. there's two places of interplay. So one, um, the EHBs do not follow um, the local preference system. They are on a separate waiting list. Um, and they needed to be added to the list of programs uh, and it's called targeted funding. And so it's a separate admissions process entirely. The other piece of the interplay is uh, a number of homeless clients would prefer to have the regular voucher as opposed to the EHV. And we have anecdotally experienced people turning down the EHV and saying, well, I'm going to get it with the set aside preference. So, and I'd rather have the regular voucher, um, which isn't helpful because the EHV voucher actually comes with thousands of dollars of more resources to help that family uh, and is the, the better tool for helping homeless families. And we need to lease those up. Um, so that's, that's the two places where the interplay is. And so we have what, like 300 or so EHVs? Uh, yeah, I think the number was, is it 249 or 349? I don't know if Marie is on. For, for the EHV? Yeah. It's 269. 269. And I think we had spoken at one point, there was like, we'd leased up like 40 of those or something. Yeah. So when we talk about 89% of recent um folks taken off the waiting list or you know given a voucher are we talking about like the regular voucher at that point correct that's yeah. the regular voucher program yes. so the concern that i have is if we have a one in five preference for you know families experiencing homelessness and then on top of that we also have you know 270 slots which we're having trouble filling I'm trying to think of, is there a way that we can push people towards the EHV since we're having trouble filling that and it's earmarked for families experiencing homelessness and it comes with better funding? Um, what's the way to square that circle? Well, uh, you could change the ratio. Um, you could put a pause on the preference and say until the EHV program hits a certain lease up threshold, um, we're going to pause the set aside preference. Um, or you could eliminate the preference. Um, Commissioner Buder, um, the families that do come in for the um, for the HSV, you know, the HSVP program, we do also check with our COC to see if they are one of the referrals that they'll be submitting to, um, to the housing authority. So we, that is a priority for us is to interview all the EHVs. And, and I think to, to put a more fine point on it, um, the EHV uses a, uh, an assessment system that is different than our waiting list. So we could get a referral from somebody for the set aside homeless preference and they would not be in the next hundred names that we would receive from EHV. So it's possible they would be a different group of homeless. Yeah. 
I think I want to bring other folks into the discussion, but my I have a couple of thoughts from a policy perspective. One is that you know there's so much research out there on um, the benefits that stable housing and particularly with our new payment standards, stable housing in a opportunity area can have for children. And um, so from a policy perspective, it feels a little bit like a miss to not have anything here that's um, prioritizing families with kids. You know, it feels like we can kind of break the cycle of poverty with those dollars, um, you know, relative to some other uses. So that's that's kind of one thing. And I'm trying to figure out how do we balance that with with something that feels a little bit maybe overweighted towards one particular category, you know, particularly in light of um, I appreciate what you're saying about um, somebody could be referred to one program and not to another. You know, they might be referred and have a hard time getting off the other, you know, getting into the other program. But um, you know, given that we we have another bucket, another sleeve, uh, in addition to now we're saying one out of every five, um, feels like it might be a little bit heavy. And then I do have this you know, policy concern about making sure that, um, you know, we're also focusing on families with children. Yeah, I think that the families with children, um, so it's a it's an interesting policy discussion um, that I, I need to do some more research on because the challenge is this, if you don't have the special HUD mobility vouchers and you don't have MTW, creating a preference that doesn't run afoul of fair housing law that targets families with children and encourages or requires them to use it in a high opportunity area. Um, it, it hasn't been done before. And, it, and I believe the reason it hasn't been done is because of fair housing concerns. So where it has been done, it's been court ordered. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the mobility demonstration, at, yeah. which is at the federal level, that has a preference for families with kids, you yep. know, 13 and under. And yeah, um, so somebody's doing something that's. Uh, but that was specifically allowed because they're in the demonstration. And that's, yeah, that's the challenge of I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to create it on the fly without mm -hmm. checking into that. Yeah, and that's fair. I mean, but that's that's sort of a procedural question in a way, aside from like the, you know, in a way our our role here is to think about some of the public policy, you know, yeah. implications. And if there's a way for us to, you know, help a bunch of kids um, where they're not, you know, the next cycle of families that are, um, you know, in need of, uh, public assistance, then that's obviously a huge win from a policy perspective. Um, and there's just so much research out there coalescing around that, that it feels like um, a miss to, obviously, reducing homelessness is a key public policy objective as well. Um, and the amount of money that we're going to spend on people that are not stably housed is massive, you know, too. But um, But that's just something that's very top of mind. I had some follow-up questions. I don't know if anybody else has questions. Um, make sure that the other commissioners have an opportunity. Um, Commissioner Bastos, I see you're unmuted. Did you have something? Um, well, I did ask a question in the personnel committee. I don't remember what that question was, but I don't know if Tori remembers, but. What I think I'm trying to remember was I asked him, you know, because you might have, I told him, you know, you have all these waiting lists and, you know, what you're trying to do is make sure that you're, <clears throat> I asked him, is this something that HUD is recommending? And also, is it gonna help to alleviate? Cause there, there could be people on the list that maybe already have housing you know, and that way it could give an opportunity for the next family or the next, you know, client. 
whether it be a veteran or the homeless to, so I don't know if Tori remembers my question, but I did ask. Yeah, so uh, your, your question was dealing with, um, you know, so what happens to somebody today uh, who has the elderly or disabled preference? Um, and what would happen under the new plan? And, and today what happens is somebody with those 15 points for being elderly or disabled um, isn't coming to the top of the list. Uh, they're being crowded out by other people with other preferences. Um, and we had set up a, a system that was creating all of these different categories and giving them different points. And then when they were added up, we were finding that there were whole groups of people that were practically never going to come to the top of the list that might really need a voucher. Um, and we know we don't have enough vouchers for everybody. We know nationally we don't have enough vouchers for everybody. Um, and so that a lottery system is a, a fairer way of giving people a shot. Um, and because of the city and the county um, policy preferences on ending homeless, uh, we were going to keep that one preference um, in place. Um, and the other preference that we were going to keep is basically a uh, make people whole preference. So if we gave, if we issued somebody a voucher and then we fell into shortfall and HUD told us to take that voucher away, uh, we created a highest level preference that then when funding was there, they would be the first people who got a voucher. Um, but beyond that and the homeless set aside, um, we wouldn't be selecting anybody based on a preference anymore. It would just be based on a lottery position. Yeah. All right, so I wanted to, uh, you know, approach this sort of more like a, like a recipe um, and just ask some sort of foundational questions. Um, what you know, do I understand from the report? Am I reading it correctly that you know 89% means that you know just shy of nine out of ten vouchers today are issued uh, to the homeless set aside uh, applicants? Yes, correct. Yes. And we're proposing to move from just shy of nine out of ten to be two out of ten or one out of five. Correct. And it was not our intention to be at 89%. And it is our intention by way of this policy, the recommendation that we go from 89 to 20%. Um, I'm not sure what the board's uh, preference or direction was. That's why I was changing it. And I, I'm, I'm open to other ratios, but um, one out of five uh, is a, a higher ratio. Uh, than many housing authorities, but it is not the highest. I've seen others that have a one in four ratio. Um, okay. So uh, another question I have is, and maybe this is specific to uh, Maria, but either way, what broadly, what are some of the uh, eligibility criteria for homeless set aside? And this one could be pretty topical because I, I have another question that will sort of branch off of that one. Okay, for the set the for the homeless set aside, in order to qualify for that preference, they need to be ca case managed, and we have our partner agencies that work with these families. So, in order to be um, to qualify for this preference, um, case workers are working with the client for them to become self sufficient. Okay, so. Um, are those case managers, um, do they, do any of them work for the housing authority or are they all with external partners? They're external partners or partner agencies. Okay. So do we have any sense of the barriers to participation or uptake or any, any sort of evaluative metric to determine, you know, the the reach and effectiveness of uh, these third party, these external partners, 
who are referring people to us for homeless set aside vouchers? You know, do, do we do any audits or is there any sort of reporting that's required to be considered an external partner where they've got to say, you know, we had 5,000 people apply, but we were only able to talk to 37 of them, or we talked to 100% of the people who filled out our application, or do we have any sense of, you know, their, their program as they interface with us and we uh, agree or, or don't to assign or work toward assigning a homeless set-aside voucher? Uh, not formally. No. And yes. And I, and I would say that anecdotally, uh, the staff has had some concerns that people are being referred to us um, that aren't receiving Correct. the one year of supportive services. Yes. Okay. And um, I, I guess, is there an awareness or concern or or is it anecdotal and not actually borne out through any data um you know i'm trying to figure out how to ask this question but basically a thing that i'm interested in learning more about is sort of the relationship between how many households who are eligible to be served by the housing authority in monterey county how many households are meet either uh, a sort of a colloquial definition of homelessness versus how many households meet a federal definition of homelessness and then how many households meet this uh, external partner one year of services definition of homelessness and which of those is most served least served and I, I mean I, I appreciate I haven't actually quite gotten to a question but does it are you, are you able to understand toward kind of the direction I'm headed with trying to understand the relationship between these different groups of of potential yeah. participants? Um, and and I don't I don't know the the numbers, and I'm not sure uh, even that the the homeless coalition would have uh, good data on being able to say these are the different subsets. Mm -hmm. um, it's somewhat of a fluid situation. Um, yeah, and the reason I'm asking that is because I'm worried that we have you know of uh, I appreciate that anybody who meets is 60% of median income is, you know, theoretically is, is eligible to apply to the housing choice voucher program. But if 89% of those vouchers are going to people who have been in this uh, su pro support program, uh, supportive services programs for a year or more, you know, there's, there's a finite resource and, and in not infinite, but, but need that exceeds that finite resource. So, I'm worried about, you know, as this report says, you know, we, we're by operation of this program as it stands today, there are people who are not being serviced who would otherwise be eligible because this one group of people is uh, using 89% of the resources. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're trying to balance that out. And I understand that. But I also am worried that if we go down to one in five or one in 10 or one in 20 or whatever number that we will uh that we could be unintentionally uh harming a different group of people because we're trying to open it up to to be more equitably accessible but ultimately um you know it, it we didn't capture the right data or we didn't shape it just right and so we've uh ended up just pushing that missed opportunity to a different group but it's still there yeah, so I uh, raised this uh, preference change uh, as a proposal uh, at the Coalition uh, for the Homeless uh, board meeting um, and didn't receive any questions or pushback or follow-up questions from the group. Um, and, and I let them know that the board meeting was tonight and I'm not sure that I see anyone um, signed up uh, for public comment. So I, I think that there are enough, enough is not the right word. There are many homeless programs right now and lots of resources coming to the county um, to target homeless. Um, and for us, the biggest one is EHV and we desperately need that program to work. And right now, the way this system is set up, we're spending all of our time verifying preferences that people don't qualify for. Um, and the other 
piece that we'll talk about in a later item is we have a huge wave of HAP funding coming in and we desperately need to lease up the program um, and quickly. Um, and these admin changes are one of the things that will make it easier uh, to lease up the program because right now uh, we are serving some of the hardest to house with the most barriers and the hardest uh, to convince landlords to take them. Okay, uh, and my last question is, do we have any sense of the demographics of uh, people on a wait list who are not, um, who are not on the house, homeless set aside wait list uh, in terms of um, you know, the composition of the family, whether there's anybody, you know, anybody who is you know, legally a juvenile, whether it's anybody with any sort of uh, special needs or people pursuing education or, or any, you know, female head of household. Um, do we have any sense of the, the demographics of people outside of the homeless set aside program? I'm not sure what information uh, the team is able to pull together. Yeah, would have to run a report, but the majority of the set aside homeless preference, um, the families that we have is just a single, they're single individuals. Um, so one of the biggest problem that we have with the set aside, we're encountering that a lot of the referrals that we're receiving, they don't qualify for the preference, they need to qualify under the McKinney Act. And so it makes it very difficult for us to determine whether they are homeless or not. So, okay, so agent, yeah, so for going back to your question, I mean, I would have to run a report. Um, yeah, and I'm not necessarily looking for the, the actual numbers right now in the meeting. I'm just, I'm wondering if we, if we keep that data, do we have access to the data of the applicants outside of the homeless set aside uh, voucher program? Um, no, until they actually come in, that's when we get all the data. Okay, so I, just sort of to, Compliment uh, Hans uh, Vice Chair Booter's uh, questions and comment. I'm, you know, I'm worried about who we are not able to bring into the program because 89% of the vouchers are going uh, to the homeless set aside, and and you know, I don't know. There's any number of ways to approach that. You know, if if you have a hundred people, it, this is theoretical and hypothetical, but if you had a hundred people in Monterey County that were eligible to receive some assistance from the Housing Authority, and 89 of them were homeless and 11 were not. But it would make sense, you know, the numbers would just bear out if you were able to help all of them, 89% would be the, the ratio, you know, 89 out of 100 that you would help. But if we have fewer vouchers, fewer uh, ways to help people than the people number of people applying, and it's not even a one for one where, you know, proportionately we're helping each group relative to the size of each group, you know, we need to make a policy decision um, about where we're going to focus our efforts and, um, you know, I, I'm particularly frustrated about the limited time and resources that our professional staff has and to go through this process repeatedly only to see uh, something not work out or someone not even be eligible in the first place. You know, I don't know if that's a training issue with our partners, if that is sort of a, you know, a, a willful ignorance to you know, push people through that that aren't going to be eligible just to say that you, you push people through um, or, you know, maybe hoping that it takes enough time administratively so that when we at the housing authority review their file, it's been a, a year and a day, a year and a week, and they just snuck past that one year deadline to make them eligible. Um, but nevertheless, you know, every minute and every dollar that we spend outside of helping people, you know, achieve housing is a minute and a dollar that doesn't go to getting people housed. And, um, you know, we can't have a batting average of one, but, you know, as best we can, every contact we make should be, you know, with the goal of and, and appropriately scoped so that we have the highest return on investment for the residents of Monterey County who are relying on us to perform the highest and best uh, possible service. And Chair, if I can just clarify, the, the year of service is the partner is supposed to provide that after they're placed. So it's not a, it's not a pre-requirement. What the pre-requirement is that they meet the McKinney homeless definition. And that's where we run into trouble is the service provider are referring people who don't meet that definition. Do you, um, perhaps you're not in a position to answer this question, but do you think that's a training issue or is it, you know, there is a particular 
and please don't name them at this point, but is is it your feeling that there's just a particular partner that just signs everybody up and they're not, you know, there's no vetting of that? Or what does that look like? I think um, some of it is a training issue and some of it is just a resource allocation of this is a resource and this is the, you know, when the waiting list is closed, this is the only way to get on the waiting list. And so people are like, well, yeah, let me shoot you over. We'll see what happens. Commissioner Wizard, um, I do want to say that we do have our quarterly meetings with our partner agency and we really do stress to them and we remind them about the McKinney Hearth Act definition. And, you know, we do question some of their referrals, um, but, you know, it's you, we have quarterly meetings with them all constantly, or we talk to that partner agency, but it is like you said, it could be a training issue that we just need to go back and speak to the partner agencies. Um, because they always have different people. It's not always them. I mean, they, um, you know, it's an ongoing for them to get new um, social workers. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm cognizant that this uh, agenda item has uh, gone on for some amount of time, and I know that there's, uh, Tori, you offered to take a break, so I, I'm under the impression you have more to share. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think the questions have helped uh, fill some of those out. Um, I, I think it is, it is a policy question that's appropriate for the board to, to wrestle with. Um, I think that the need on our end is we need to have a system that works well, that increases our success rate. And right now what we're doing isn't working. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions before we go out to public comment? I want to make sure that, that we open that up. All right, I don't hear and see anyone else. So, uh, I'll go out to public comment. Is there any member of the public wishing to comment on uh, on this agenda item uh, and about the homeless set aside and the way that we facilitate the, the use of the vouchers? Okay. Well, hearing and seeing no one, we'll come back from public comment, and I will ask commissioners if they have any uh, any comments before we we move the agenda. But if I could just get uh, just a second, I see it is a new business item, um, and so you know we can take action. But before we get too far in, Tori, is there a is there a timeline on this? Do you need a decision? today or by a date certain? Um, I would I would love to be able to move forward with as much of it as possible. And if there were items that um, caused heartburn that we think about ways to ameliorate that, uh, because we, we do have all of this new HAP money coming in and we need a workable situation because otherwise Maria is going to have to call in another 700 families and you know, wind up with 35 people. Sure. Well, so it's, you know, in trying to understand how best to use the new HAP uh, monies that we will discuss in the next agenda item uh, in detail, I, you know, I'll just start the conversation by saying, I think that, you know, one in five, uh, given the difficulty in people finding places to lease up with the housing choice voucher, and that not everybody meets the federal definition of homelessness, um, that it we should reorient our program. I think 89% is too high. Um, that being said, I am not the program officer who has that right number dialed in and is a policy choice. I think one in five, um, especially given the tremendous influx of housing choice voucher monies for this next year uh, should really be a ceiling. Um, and I would love to hear comments from the other commissioners about where to go with this. Would one in four change it dramatically? Oh, 
Corey? Uh, one and four, I think, would go in the, the wrong direction from what oh, okay. uh, Chair Wizard was uh, suggesting. You know, I think one option would be to add language um, either tied to our utilization level. Uh, so if the housing authority is below 95% uh, utilization level, um, the homeless preference doesn't kick in. And then if, it, if we're above 95, then it does kick in. Another way to do it would be um, to take a six month pause on the set aside preference um, and get through the first five months of the year um, and then open it up again, uh, or to change it from one in five to one in six to one in 10. Um, And it, I, mean, I mean, I mean, Maria, you had mentioned something about this. You're basically saying it's a subtly different pool between the EHV and yes. the set I mean, aside. Yes, I mean, I had a real, I mean, because I know, like Tori mentioned, we have uh, not been in compliance. And it's been a big issue since I've been in this um, in this position and I have brought it up. Um, other housing authorities have it by date and time, which is, makes it a lot easier and it's much faster for us to put more families out there. Um, or we could do the lottery, which is a lot easier too. Uh, because of these preference, we are like the only housing authority has these unique preferences and these, these preferences have been um, with this agency for years that I know of. And um, since I used to do audits too, we were always not in compliance because of the way we do our selections. And it, it does take a lot of our time, especially staff, um, because when we open it on, on the portal, it, it lists all the preferences and if you know all the families are going to apply everything so it makes it very and makes it very impossible for us to get like Tori mentioned just you know we when we did the 700 a lot of them um, um, lost their preferences the ones that we'll be getting would be the ones that are in place that have 65 points um, but those are not going to get served because I have the homeless set aside that they're ranking 100 or 115 points above everybody else. And so in Tori's memo, it's not really relevantly fair for those people that applied online um, when we did have our wait list open. So the ones that are getting housing are the ones that didn't apply at the time when the, the wait list was open. And, so, you know, I stress, I really did stretch um, with COC to please refer all the um, EHV referrals because what I'm doing, I'm checking all the referrals with the HSVP. And if they're on that list, I'm putting them through through EHVs. So what if we, uh, I'll just throw a proposal out there that I guess has a few aspects to it. Um, what if we paused on the homeless preference for six months while we go through this big lease up and it's gonna be important that we use these dollars. Um, and we also want to get the EHV you know, program leased up. So pause it for six months. And why don't we for now say one in 10, um, we can come back and change it at any point. Um, and, you know, from a personal level, I'll throw this in there um, from a policy perspective. Could we potentially um, uh, have Tori go and study the concept of a parallel preference um, for families with children, um, probably seeking some legal counsel? Um, and then we could come back and reconvene next month and, you know, continue the discussion. Yeah, that works for me. Are there any other uh, commissioners who have thoughts about that proposal, uh, disagree with it, or think it's so good they'd like to second that as a motion? Um, I have a question. Um, Please. OK, I, I'm trying to ab absorb all this information. Um, it's um anyway um when you say to like um like to put 
you know, like put the waiting list or to put put it on hold. Um, do you mean like for several months or? Yeah, so for six months, we wouldn't use the homeless set aside preference and we would just be going on a lottery basis. Okay, my only, my only concern or thought is uh, with winter coming up, um, the, the the homeless um, population here in Monterey is um, it, it, it's really um, multiplied, um, and and so anyway, um, I would hate to see the homeless left out at this point. But I know that I know that the um, that families with children also are a priority. But um, I don't know. Um, do you think that maybe the time, um, like the timing, uh, like to, to put them on hold could be better suited maybe in the spring or summer? I, well, I yeah, so the, the timing issue uh, for us is we need to spend the money uh, in the winter. Okay. So we, we can't wait to spend the money until the summer or the spring. Okay. The other thing I, is, from a, from a lottery perspective, all of the people that have this set aside preference, they'll still be in the lottery. We're not saying that they won't be in the lottery. They'll still be in the lottery. And they still have the advantage of they've been able to apply when nobody else has been able to apply. So the, the waiting list is overrepresented um, with people from this category. So we'll still be serving homeless, just okay. not 89% and just not 20%. Okay. And Commissioner Goodwin, and also those people, they may be on the the on the EHV, the emergency housing vouchers. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So Francine, we have this parallel program um, where we've got 269 of these emergency housing vouchers that are targeted specifically towards, you know families experiencing homelessness. Um, and we've leased up, you know, the last count, like around 40 of 269. Um, and so part of the part of the thought process is, hey, can we accelerate that process by um, pushing folks in that bucket, um, fill that up first. And if those don't get used by December 31, 20. Three, three, they get taken away. Okay. So we have to use those vouchers. Okay. Okay. So I guess the only thing I'd say is the homeless still have a unique access. Okay. Sleeve of yeah vouchers that are just for them. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Appreciate it. And on the EHV, um, we have received over 300 referrals. And um, so a lot of them, even if they get referred, um, we can't find them. So it's been taking a long time for us just to get them in here. And we've been working with the partner agencies and with um, COC to make more referrals to us. That can be challenging. It is very challenging. Are there any other uh, questions or comments, concerns about the proposal to push pause on the homeless set aside program for six months, if I remember correctly, and then uh, once that six month runs to set the standard at one in 10? And again, yeah. that's with the caveat that um, you know, once we get into that, if that's what the board chooses to do and we get into that, we, of course, deserve the right to make any adjustment whatsoever at any time, but just sort of uh, charting a course for the future, we have to pick somewhere. I'm not hearing or seeing any, uh, any uh, comments. Um, one or the other, really. So, Vice Chair Booter, if, if you wanted to make that a motion and see if there's a second out there and then take a vote. Yeah. So, I guess my motion would be we move to essentially this lottery based system. 
that's the default. And um, we're going to create um, a set aside for families experiencing homelessness. Uh, we are gonna institute it six months from now. Uh, and it will be a unique sleeve within the HCV program uh, where one out of every 10 um, vouchers, new vouchers um, awarded will go to a family that fits that category. And then the last piece that I would propose is that we direct Tory to explore uh, the legal feasibility of um, uh, a parallel preference for families with children. Yeah. All right, well, it's been properly moved. Is there a second? I will second it. Okay, it's been properly moved by Vice Chair Booter and seconded by Commissioner Ballesteros. Uh, and you know, forgive me, but my best attempt at restating the motion is um, to move to a one in 10 standard for the homeless set aside after six months uh, of pausing the program. Um, and when we resume the program, the executive director shall pursue uh, research about the feasibility and the legality of creating a separate program or tract within the program to support uh, families experiencing homelessness. Is that about capture it, Commissioner Booter? Yeah, the, the only difference I would say is, you know, I'd love for, um, you know, Tori to take a look at that, talk to, get some counsel on that, the feasibility of that. And then I think we could just talk about it next meeting and yeah, kind of put this to bed. You're talking more of a mobility program? Or yeah. I, yeah. Or um, families with kids. Really just families with, really just families with, with children. Okay. Um, uh, so... Okay, um, uh, I will uh, ask for the roll call vote then, please. Commissioner Wizard. Aye. Commissioner Booter. Yes. Commissioner Healy. Commissioner Ballesteros. Yes. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you. We'll next move to item 9D. Uh, actually, you know what? Um, it is 6.45. It is later than we normally go. Um, we have an important item that we, we have to hear tonight, which is uh, item 9D. Uh, Tori, 9E, the operating budget, um, could that be heard in November or do you need that tonight? Uh, the operating budget is already past due. Um, okay. I can make it a short presentation. Yeah, I'm just trying to do some meeting management. Um, yeah, and, and I can, I can, I, and I think the payment standards can be a shorter conversation because the board has been through this process before. So I, I can give okay. less background. Do you think that we are, well, yeah, I, unfortunately, I have a couple of questions on 90. Do you think that we are uh, over or under 30 minutes before ending the meeting? It depends on the number of questions. I can keep my part short. Okay, um, let's press on then. Um, we'll do item 9D, resolution 3074, establishing new payment standards for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Tori, go ahead. So the, the short background is we just did this and we had a r amazing result with the fair market rents, which went up 36%. Um, and that means that some of the rents that the payment standards that we had just passed uh, we no longer have the authority to keep and we need to raise them. And so what we've done is created new payment standards. Um, and essentially, uh, we have four different ways of doing that. We have uh, zip codes at 100% of FMR. We have one zip code at 110% of FMR. And then we have the small area FMRs. And we have uh, four zip codes at 100% of the small area FMR and one, two, three, four, five, six zip codes at 110% of the small area FMR, which are uh, the communities on the peninsula and have traditionally been out of reach for many of our households. Um, so those were the payment standards um, that uh, I am proposing. Um, and we need to 
increase payment standards. Um, this is more aggressive uh, than the minimum that we need to do, uh, but I have good policy reasons uh, to do it as well as financial reasons to do it because we are expected to get another 10 to $15 million. Um, and this is a $50 million program. So it's a huge increase uh, and we need to spend that money um, because then we get it back with interest the following year. All right, questions from the board? Just for the benefit of, of the board members, I uh, saw some of this information early on and, and had a dialogue with Tori and uh, we went back and forth on a few things, but, um, uh, and that's gonna, that is a good introduction for one of the questions I have, but I wanted to make sure others had an opportunity to ask questions. I just think it's, I just think it's, um, you know, like Tori said, on a base of, you know, of course we have a $50 million, um, you know, budget from HUD on the voucher program. And, you know, by, by using the funds in this way, if we have an ability to get additional 10 to $15 million, I mean, that is a shocking result. And I just kind of tip my hat to Tori for the, um, you know, the, the ingenuity, I think, that went into this. It takes a, a sophisticated operator to pull this off. And the analysis that was done of, hey, how can we maximize, um, you know, this program? Uh, you know, I've, I've looked at some of those spreadsheets. And what he basically was able to do was increase the, the subsidy for families. There's, there's like basically not a single... Uh, you know, community that went down, everybody went up, all boats floated up. And, um, and we got it in addition to that, potentially the ability to serve extra families. Um, and I just think that's a huge win. So, you know, for the team and for, um, for Tori, I think this just makes so much sense and just take my hat off to you guys. I mean, in this kind of, um, you know, environment, like working with HUD, I mean, that's just not something that you see every day. And so for this to be like effectively the biggest increase in, you know, FMR in the country as a result of this special rent survey that we conducted, I mean, you know, we kind of went for the extra credit offering here. And I just think um, it's just a huge victory. So I don't want to miss out on that. Tip my hat to everyone. You know, great comments, uh, Vice Chair Buter, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, it's a truly tremendous increase, and it's you know unfathomable that you know the conversation before we see these numbers is yeah, it's just really hard to get housing choice vouchers you know under contract. It's really hard to find opportunities for folks with vouchers, and we do this. You know, you the staff does this research, and turns out yeah, it was because it was about a third too low. Uh, and that's why we had such a hard time getting these vouchers taken up. And, you know, incredibly, we were able to convince the feds that yeah, they're so loath to be, you know, hard, so hard to use that we're underutilizing the opportunity and uh, they're on the hook and agreed to pay more. It's, it's really incredible. And uh, so I only have topical questions, but um, one of them is in the staff report, uh, it looks like you made reference to some uh, local knowledge um, and local conditions where you made adjustments to some of the uh, more historically expensive zip codes uh, that uh, kind of line the Monterey Peninsula region uh, relative to the median income and, and cost of living throughout the entire county. And if memory serves one of those zip codes, uh, it's the third, fourth, the last graph in your uh, report on page 55 of the packet. Uh, you list uh, three, four, five, six zip codes, but I noticed one of them is not 93950, uh, which is the city of Pacific Grove. And I subsequently on page 57, looking at the table, I see um, Pacific Grove 93950 is um, lower than Monterey at 93940 um, and some of its other neighbors. Um, uh, Yep, I can, the, I can, I can make that change. We can go to 110% there. 
I, I just, the reason I'm asking, and thank you, but the reason I was asking was just to harmonize the inputs we have given the local knowledge and not to uh, leave someone out unless we have that discussion around why it would be important to do that. But uh, that hearing, stood your out comment to me too. Now, yeah. hearing your comment just now, it seems like uh, we can make that adjustment. And again, this isn't necessarily, um, you know, uh, Hackam is on the hook to pay out all these all these dollars and where's the money going to come from? It's the federal funding. And if we don't use it, we'll lose it. So uh, I appreciate that we're trying to maximize opportunities for people all across uh, Monterey County, but especially in those places, because a subsequent question I had offline uh, commissioners uh, that I'll just share some some topical details with you is um, I asked about uh, voucher utilization by zip code. And just for your reference, um, there are 735 voucher holders in 93901, which is in Salinas. And there are 95 in Pacific Grove. And there are four in Carmel. So I appreciate that we want to expand the opportunity and get people into these high resource areas where um, we know that there are uh, positive outcomes for uh, health and livelihood. Um, and so if we can increase payment standards in those places that are traditionally less accessible, you know, hopefully we can make positive changes in people's lives and, and you know, break cycles of poverty and increase uh, all of the factors that lead to longevity and health and wellness. So um, I guess now that I've worked my way through it, it was really just that one question. Great, and I, I would just offer a friendly amendment that the uh, the memo, the resolution is the uh, the 1024, not the 1022 memo. And uh, I will update, I've already updated the chart on my desktop, but I'll make sure that the corrected uh, 93950 uh, reflects the 110% small area FMR. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any other questions before we go to public comment? Okay. Uh, any members of the public wishing to comment on this agenda item about housing uh, uh, housing assistance payments and the uh, rent study and the increase to the HAP? Uh, please make yourself known. Uh, you'll have three minutes to comment on this agenda item. Um, hello, I do. Go ahead. Okay, my name is uh, Diana Reese, and I work in the Section 8 department. I'm a housing program specialist, and I've been um, processing rent increases for the past 15 months. Um, and I disagree with the proposal for the new payment standards. I understand the logic regarding raising the payment standard, which is to receive more funding for the HCV program. But by raising the payment standard, we're also hurting our community. We're sending a message to the landlords telling them that these are the rents per bedroom size. 2,000 went 100 for a studio in Salinas in South County or 2,675 for a two bedroom unit. I know that these rents are, are, are high. I deal with rent increases request on a daily basis. I conduct rent surveys in order to approve rent increases. Um, you can search on Craigslist and you can see that the rents are lower than the proposed payment standards by, you know, um, by the landlords. But landlords are gonna see our payment standards and assume that th this is what the market is and they're gonna start increasing the rents, not just to the families receiving section eight assistance, but to the Monterey County community. This is an ag community, families earning minimum wage. Yes, we're doing a service to our families on the program, but we're also doing a disservice to the Monterey County community. We're making it unaffordable. We will create more families to become homeless due to not be able to, um, they won't be able to afford their rents. The solution is not increasing the payment standard. The solution is to is for Hackham to work with the cities and the Monterey County to build more units. We need to build units to better serve the communities. Santa Cruz County ranked the second more, most expensive place to live in the country. But Hackham is proposing to increase the payment standard 
higher than Santa Cruz and Santa Clara Housing Authority. Once again, we will do a disservice to the Monterey County community. I propose to res um, revise the amounts that are being increased in the payment standard. Um, and saying that by us increasing the payment standard, landlords are gonna um, wanna uh, um, rent to Section 8 clients. That's not the case. I dealt with that. I did move-ins, I do inspections and landlords just don't wanna rent to Section 8 clients. It doesn't matter if we increase the payment standard to $5,000 for a one bedroom, landlords are not gonna wanna rent to them. It's, you know, they're looking at families who have good credit, our families, most of them don't have good credit that are working, um, that have a security deposit. Secure deposit has become a I'm big not. issue because the rent being 2,100 for a studio, that means that they want a $4,000 secure deposit. Family okay, will you please, don't have that. Will you please bring your comments to a close? We've reached the end of your three minute period. Sure, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate your comments and they're very helpful for helping us uh, form up a discussion. Are there any other members of the public wishing to make comments on uh, this agenda item? Okay, hearing and seeing then we'll close public comment, return to the board for uh, additional follow-up questions or comments. Yeah, Chair Wizard, I, I disagree with a lot of that, but there is one part of it that, that um, I do agree with, which is in tandem with this, I think it would be beneficial for the board to direct Tori and Maria and the team to really um, double down on uh, how they think about rent and reasonableness. So basically these are caps, right? This is like the most that we will pay. There's actually, you have to subtract a utility allowance, which can be $300 or so. Um, so these aren't actually rents. You have to subtract the utility allowance. And then these are caps. This is a maximum. So um, that being said, we're supposed to only rent if we can prove out that the rent that's being proffered by the landlord is a market rate rent for that quality of unit in that area. And I just want to make really sure, especially because these caps are high, doesn't mean we have to pay them, that if we see a studio and they say, hey, we want 2,100 bucks, uh, and we say, hey, actually, we think it's worth 1,500 bucks, I just want to make sure that that process that we have in place is really robust and that we are paying attention to make sure that it's fully staffed and that we you know have confidence that um you know that we are following through on that aspect of this yeah rent reasonableness still has to take place on all of the units and just to follow up on the vice chair's comments is there do you know off offhand or maybe uh, Maria does the last time that that uh, process or procedure was uh, last evaluated and critiqued and updated? Uh, we had a discussion about it just this week uh, to make sure that we all were on the same page of what the process looked like and what the tools are available, um, both in terms of there are already landlords saying, hey, I want a huge rent increase and you know what to tell them and, and and it's exactly like hans has said of hey this is the cap if the market isn't there then we can only offer you a reasonable rent and i think you know the the other point is um we are trying to do this fast because the timing of the changes are important um and statutorily we have to make some changes um but there's nothing to say that if six months from now, the data is telling us that certain zip codes, the payment standard is too high and nobody is getting rent reasonableness at that level, they can be lowered. You know, that's not against the rules. Sure. Um, and then the other uh, thing I wanted to say was I totally agree with, uh, with the public comment about uh, working with cities to create more units. You know, broadly, it's supply and demand. If there's a thousand people looking for one house, you know, whoever's got the most cash is going to win that auction. But if there's more homes available, then, you know, there's more, uh, there's more uh, quantity, there's more stock available and people don't have to compete as much, which means you're spending 
not every dollar you have to secure stable, decent, and affordable housing. So uh, I'm 100% with that comment. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I also think that, you know, I, I live in the 93955 zip code, and I don't know that there are many places, uh, many three-bedroom places that would rent for $4,829 a month, but there certainly are some. And if part of the Brett reasonableness study is to say, you know, um, if I if I'm a, a tenant, uh, excuse me, if I'm a voucher holder and I have the opportunity to live uh, somewhere that has an HOA fee, that has utilities that I have to worry about, that is a nicer home that somebody just knows me and they don't live there and they want to let me rent their place and it costs 4200 that would be fair, but our cap was 38 well, what am I going to do? So being a, being setting it high and coming back down, I think is a better policy decision, better policy perspective than setting it too low and just shrugging if you're if it comes in at more, because our hands are tied if rent is higher than what we'll pay, but if the rent is lower than what the maximum threshold is, that gives us opportunities and options, and I think that is critical when we're talking about a very diverse and broad group of people who are, you know, it's not like we're selling a widget, right? We're not saying come buy this, you know, five dollar burrito. And it's, it's five bucks for everybody, no matter where you are. You know, housing across this county, especially, is unique in price, not just from city to city, but from neighborhood to neighborhood. And, um, you know, I live two blocks away from the border of Delray Oaks. Uh, and if you look down the map, you know, there would be no reason why it would cost more money to live in a house two blocks away from where I live. But it does. And that's a different zip code. And if our payment standards do not capture that, uh, that micro, that hyper micro economic difference, you know, we will struggle to serve families. And so it is a balancing act. You know, the, the public comment I thought was uh, timely and, and useful for this discussion because it, it does, you know, not dissimilar from the basic allowance for housing for our uh, neighbors who are active and reserve military uh, personnel. You know, they have a tax free subsidy to pay for their housing. And that raises rents for everybody. It raises home values for people. And so there is already a group who doesn't have to pay for housing and it makes it harder for us that do. So should we tell people who have even fewer resources and don't get a tax-free benefit from the federal government? Um, now, granted, they're working for it, but should we tell one group that gets it, that's okay, but another group who gets it, that's not okay? Uh, you know, it, either the rule is applied uniformly or it's not. And I, I'm not prepared to tell people who have very few resources and are otherwise couch surfing or living in a car that they can't enjoy increased rent payments um, while people uh, in the military uh, get to have a similar benefit. Now, granted, um, you know, serving the country and their armed forces is certainly a sacrifice and we should reward that uh, as best we can. Um, but I don't believe anybody should be forced to live in a car uh, out of a policy decision by some bureauc bureaucratic board. Um, when we have the opportunity to provide them safe, decent, and affordable housing through another mechanism. So uh, it is a difficult conversation and, and it's, uh, those comments are well heard, but um, you know, we have to, we have to figure out how to, to walk that tightrope and what we were doing currently left a lot of people out. And so trying to figure a way to bring more of them in, um, you know, we have to at least look under that rock. We have to at least, you know, explore that before we make adjustments uh, and, and say, no, thank you. So, uh, are there any other final questions or comments from commissioners before um, someone offers a motion? Okay, I don't hear or see any other comments or questions. So um, what is the will of the board? I make a motion to approve um, subject to that one small change about 93950 that you mentioned. It has been properly moved by Vice Chair Booter. Is there a second? I'll second it. And it's been seconded by Commissioner Goodwin that we adopt uh, resolution 3074 establishing new payment standard for the housing choice voucher program roll call vote please commissioner wizard aye commissioner booter yes commissioner healy commissioner ballesteros uh 
I'm going to vote no. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Okay, the motion passes 410 uh, with Commissioner Healy absent. Um, and I, you know, just in terms of uh, cooperation and teamwork, I think it's fair that we, uh, uh, if Tori, if you could note into, you know, the work plan for um, the new executive director, if, if that works out, that this get reviewed at some point uh, and the board have an opportunity to revisit it because if it's not working, we want to know. And if it's, um, you know, if it's the case that we need to make some adjustments, then um, it would be wonderful for staff to give us that information and, and to facilitate that discussion so we could make those those adjustments. I don't want to yeah. just set this on autopilot and then never revisit it. Will do. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to item 9E, uh, resolution 3075 regarding the operating budget for uh, fiscal year 22-23. Uh, so the fiscal year has already started. Uh, the budget was delayed because of uh, shortages of staff uh, in the finance department and the focus on the past due audits being done. Uh, what staff did is they took a three-year average of actual agency expenses and then other known factors um, to make um, uh, educated uh, adjustments to those three-year averages, uh, and some of those things have been highlighted. Uh, most notably, um, we have added staff in the budget uh, to the voucher department to help with all of the additional voucher work that needs to happen, and we've also added some additional staff uh, to the finance department. Uh, we decreased the electricity budget uh, because of solar credits things like that, where we had good information that would say, hey, don't use the average expense. Um, and then we also built um, a number of the property budgets had already been submitted and, and created earlier. And those all flow up into this consolidated budget. Um, from a high level view, uh, the revenue is up, the operating expenses are up, uh, the net income, uh, is about $1.8 million, uh, but a lot of that is carried interest, which isn't actual cash. And so the, forca the forecasted cash net income is just under $400,000. Um, and I'm happy to address um, other questions. Thank you very much. Any questions from commissioners about the proposed budget for the next fiscal year, the current fiscal year? I just had one question and it's not really specific to a particular uh, line item. I, I noticed that some line items, um, I'll just try to find one quickly. Um, looks like the, the um, actuals for 21, 22 were less than uh, the two prior year actuals, but then go back up in year 22, 23. Uh, one of them, as a for instance, is the management fee for Casanova. Uh, went from 63 to 74, but then down to 50. And then next year, uh, uh, wait, I lost it for Casanova. And then uh, up to 51. It's not a huge increase, but you know, nevertheless, uh, Parkside, 66, 60 to 39, and then back up to 45. But then again, proposed to go back down to 40. So just some of that volatility, if you can, if you could get to that. Yeah, those management fees uh, are based on occupancy levels and during COVID occupancy levels had gone down um, and several of the properties, we've also signed new management agreements where we increase the fees. Um, but those numbers were taken from the property budgets that were developed uh, that had finer, finer comb of information as opposed to just the three year average. That makes perfect sense. Um... There was one other thing. Um, yeah, so 
Uh, page four of eight of the budget, um, looking at some of the utility expenses, and there's some pretty marked increases uh, between the last several years and the current year. Uh, I'm wondering if there was any um, insight as to, say, uh, electricity for common areas, high, high 60s to mid 40s to low 40s, and then this year up to over 90, but then next year going back down to the low 50s. Uh, I believe that was calculated using the electricity rates uh, as a part of the formula. Um, I'm not sure if we've got um, staff that have a better answer or if I'm wrong, Beatrice or Gianova, Giovanna. Not Hi, I'm sorry. Can you guys okay. hear me? <laughs> yes. Yep. Go ahead. Um, I know that for some of the common areas where we have solar power, we don't get to use the care uh, discount till it like accumulates and then we use it. So that could be the up and down. Okay. I'm not sure if you know an exact property. Uh, no, it's just one line item for all of the common area electricity. Um, so, but that, that makes sense that, um, the cost of electricity fluctuated and, or we get a credit that is applied in one year, but not necessarily captured in the next budget, or we don't know what it is until we've received it. So that's, that is sufficient for the question I have, but Tori, I did have one more question. Um, and I just, you know, sort of, to kick the tires a little bit on the, on the budget. Um, I see that there's a expense for kitchen cabinets uh, that goes from 9,000 to 43,000 and then to zero. Um, is that from one of our recent developments? Uh, I'm or not sure that's a from- Or that, repair? That wouldn't be from recent developments. That would be based on uh, the, the informal capital needs assessment that uh, Fred and uh, Jose's team does. So I would anticipate that they had planned to do rehab last year um, and they they did uh, and they are not planning to do a kitchen cabinet replacement job this year. Okay, that makes sense. I just wanted to you know, kind of hear it said aloud that it it wasn't an accounting error that there's no way we spent that money on cabinets, but you know it's part of the program. That's all. Um, any questions or comments from other commissioners? Hearing and seeing none, I'll go out to the public. Any public comments on uh, the proposed operating budget for fiscal year 22-23? I have a question. Um, go ahead. I don't know if it's in the budget or not, but um, um, we got a notice that the, um, the security system at Casanova was going to be uh, put into place um, pretty soon. And I was just wondering if there was a time frame. Uh, I don't have that information. Jose might. Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone, uh, Commissioner. That uh, is also is already um, in progress. The only delay is in some of the parts that we need not being readily available. Um, some of those parts are back order, and we're just waiting for those parts to be here. Uh, we're depending on the contractor to give us a date. Um, the uh, agreement has already been uh, signed and approved. They have the green light to order everything. And uh, we're just pending on the vendor to tell us when uh, the parts get here. And then at that time, we uh, can get a timeline of the uh, installation of the new system. But we are uh, waiting for uh, the parts to be available. Thank you. Are the is the system going to be similar to what we had? Yes, it's going to be replaced. We are going to be um, doing a complete overhaul of the system, and a lot of the components will be replaced. Um, that includes um, the gate, the doors, um, all the all the uh, entrance points to the property. So we are working. We are already like that. Like I said, that is already um, moving. We're just pending on the delivery of the parts. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, any other questions or comments? Um, I'm sorry, I 
I had a lapse here. Did I already go out to public comment? Yes. Okay, well then um, I will entertain a motion if there are no other questions or comments. I make a motion to approve. I'll second. Second that. Oops, go on. No. Yeah. It's all good. Uh, been properly moved by Commissioner Vice-Staros and seconded by Commissioner Goodwin that we adopt the uh, operating budget for fiscal year 22-23, resolution 3075. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Wizard. Aye. Commissioner Booter. Yes. Commissioner Healy. Commissioner Ballesteros. Yes. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Motion All right. Thank you very much. Um, given the late hour, Tori, is it possible to table item 9F to a future yes. meeting? Yes. Okay. Could I, I would move that we do that. Um, and could I get a second uh, to table item 9F to uh, the next meeting? Second. All right. It, uh, we'll go out to public comment. Uh, is anybody desperately wanting to talk about item 9F, the project-based voucher program? Uh, we will talk about this. We just plan on doing it another night since it's already late in the hour and we have um, several more meetings to go. Hearing and seeing no one will come back to the board. Uh, I've moved, it's been seconded. Uh, is there any discussion on the second? All right, let's vote. Commissioner Wizard. Aye. Commissioner Ruder. Yes. Commissioner Healy. Commissioner Ballesteros. Yes. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Motion carries. All right. With unanimity, we have tabled that item to the next meeting. Uh, we'll now go to items 10 A, B, C, and D, our information reports for the staff members. I appreciate it. it's been a, a long meeting. Typically, these are shorter. If you would please do your best to keep your comments under five minutes, we would be so very grateful. Let's start with item 10 A, the human resources report. James is not on. No. Um, I, oh, that's right. He has a, a doctor's appointment. Um, so I would say there are no uh, major updates beyond what has already been shared. Okay. Uh, item 10B, our finance report. Um, and uh, Kim is also out. Um, and I can say that the, the budget passing was the, the big thing, um, and, uh, that the, uh, HAP payments, um, are trending up, uh, which is a good sign. Uh, we filled a couple of positions, um, in the finance department. And uh, we are solely focused on getting the audits done uh, by 1231, 2022. Um, and that is what the team is working on every day. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Uh, next month, uh, we'll have the HDC budget uh, for the HDC uh, approval. And that concludes my report. Great, thank you. Um, uh, 10C, the Development and Property Management Report. Okay, I'll make it quick. Uh, we expect temporary CFO on building B tomorrow, which is great news. Then we'll um, start our uh, training with property management staff by the end of the week to get our pass down from the general contractor to turn over the building and we have scheduled move-ins uh, for November 1st, if all goes well. Uh, tying in the job, we've got the scaffold completely down. They're finishing up painting the awnings on building A. We've got a few final punch items and we're pending some doors that need to be replaced that are on back order, which we expect to be done um, within the next two to three weeks max. 
And those are the major items uh, besides the grand opening that we have planned for uh, the first week in December. We'll keep you posted on that. Exciting times. Thank you for your report. Um, item 9D, the housing programs. I wanted to also, uh, Commissioner, I wanted to add something for the property management side. Please go ahead. Um, we just wanted to uh, let everyone know that the uh, King City migrant uh, contract has been executed. Uh, the contractor um, has already been on site and they'll start work on the rehab project for King City. Uh, we've also been working with uh, finance and HTC uh, to finalize the um, AR reconciliation uh, for all the RAD properties. We completed one of the um, properties already. Uh, we're working on property 80, 802 and 801. Those should be in the next board meeting. And then the last property, 803, should be on board for December. Um, and I just want to take a, an opportunity to thank uh, all my staff. They've been working really hard. Uh, we've been developing the reports, <coughs> getting everything done, working in conjunction with all the other departments. Finally got a process down. Um, and we're working on that project. That's one of our priorities. Um, other than that, um, everything else is on the report. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, now we'll move to 90, the housing programs report. Um, I'll make it quick also. Uh, my staff continues to interview families for all the programs, you know, for HCV, EHVs, project base. Um, we're also, I'm also working with our housing analysts. We're working on opening our waiting list for um, Villa Del Monte and um, the ones in Seaside and the ones here in Salinas, which is Gateway. And um, we'll be putting out a flyer soon for next month. Um, staff is also working on getting inspections done for the housing quality standards and um, like Tori mentioned I am looking into increasing um, the landlord incentive um, to, um, to make it a lot easier for us for landlords to um, house sex, um, EHV voucher holders from 500 is our incentive but I would like to increase it to 11 um, 1500 and um, I think that's everything unless the board has any questions on the board report Questions from commissioners about the uh, housing programs report? No. Okay, well, first I wanna say thank you to our staff. I know that we just spent the better part of two and a half hours, uh, mostly me droning on about minutia in these various agenda items and then gave you all collectively five minutes to share with us the last month's worth of work you've done. So thank you for your patience and for uh, uh, giving us that uh, the extra time um, and we're you know we remain grateful for all the great work that you're doing uh, it doesn't happen without you so uh, I'll consider that my commissioner comments and move to vice chair Buter. Um no I, I think I would just echo what I said earlier you know it is a really big deal to you know potentially be moving from a base of 50 million dollars to you know 60 or 65 um I just think that's such a huge win, you know, that wouldn't have happened aside from, um, you know, some hard work and some intelligent work from the team uh, led by Tori and uh, with the help of Maria. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Ballesteros. Just want to say congrats to Myra Macias on her 10 years of service. And thank you to Tori and Gabriella and all the staff for providing all this information. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Goodwin. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Tori and all the staff and the commissioners um, for uh, clarifying things and bringing this up to date. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Gama. I would just echo what all the commissioners have said. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's it. So uh, there's no other business. This meeting is adjourned. And stay tuned we for the HTC meeting. Yes, we're going to we take a short break in case anybody needs to uh, use their uh, bathroom. Um, I'll see within if everybody could return in five minutes, please.
Today is Monday, October 24th, and we're going to start uh, our regular board meeting for um, Monterey County Housing Authority Development Corporation. Um, Tori, can we go ahead and if you could take roll call, please? Uh, Director Ballesteros. Present. Director Booter. Director Gama. Present. Director Goodwin. Present. Director Healy. Director Wizard. Here. Director Booter. He may have gotten tied up with the kids. Yeah, you, you have a quorum. Okay. Um, do we have anybody uh, for public comment, Nora? Anybody that's calling in or? No one is. No one has called in, and I don't see any hands up, Dr. Bice. Okay. okay, just let me know if you see somebody uh, come in or um, or they raise their hand or something. Just let me know. Will do. Okay, and thank you. We can so, let go the ahead. record reflect that Director Booter is present. Okay, thank you. And also, um, just to let all of you know, um, after this the um, this meeting, we have the Tainan Village meeting also immediately immediately following. So um, we have the consent agenda, the approval of minutes of the HTC regular board meeting held on September 26, 2022, and then also. Um, on, I'm sorry, I'm going under 4A and 4B, Memorandum Resolution MDC 215 for the AB 361. Do I have a motion or questions? I move we approve the set agenda. I don't have anything to pull. Okay, and any, uh, a second, please? A second. Okay, was director, uh, was it director wizard? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then it was uh, director Goodwin. Uh, roll call, please. Director Ballesteros. Yes. Director Booter. Yes. Director Gama. Yes. Director Goodwin. Yes. Director Healy and director wizard. Aye. Motion. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we'll go to new business 5A. Uh, it's resolution MDC-216 approval of write-offs for South County RAD LP. Tori? So uh, typically uh, HDC would be writing off um, by property bad debt on a semi-regular basis, either quarterly or semi-annually, uh, at the very least annually. Um, and in, in this is the first of several write-offs that we'll be bringing to the board uh, that have been delayed because of the whole transition to RAD, um, which there was a problem of the software not working with the HUD track system and a bunch of adjustments needed to be made uh, going all the way back to 2016. Um, so the $14,006.03 is the amount of true bad debt write-offs uh, for the South County RAD property. Um, but then we had to make all of these adjustments. Um, and I'm trying to blow up the spreadsheet so I can actually read it. We had to make a bunch of adjustments uh, that totaled uh, over $71,000 uh, that were really phantom debt and it was not owed by the tenant. Um, and it was a result of these transactional mismatch between the two software systems. So we've cleaned all of that up and now we want to write off the $14,000. And we, we can pledge that... Uh, Jose and his team and the finance department have been through every one of these accounts, not just the ones that have write-offs, but every tenant um, to go through the process of um, making sure uh, 
uh, that all of the financial statements are correct. Are there any questions from uh, any of the directors in regards to this for the approval of the write-off? Hearing, hearing, hearing no, no response. Um, so do I have anybody on, to, on the floor to make a motion? And also, oh, before I do that, is there anybody in public comments, Nora? No, there is not. Okay, thank you. So do I have a motion on the floor for resolution MDC 216? Move approval. Thank you, Director Wizard. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Director Gama. So um, we'll go ahead to roll call. Uh, Director Wizard made the motion and Director Gama second. Yes, roll call. Uh, Director Ballesteros. Yes. Director Booter. Yes. Director Gama. Yes. Director Goodwin. Yes. Director Healy and Director Wizard. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. So Tori is going to um, handle the procedure for the election of directors for us. And I believe um, that whoever um, gets elected, the chair and the vice chair, um, Tori, I believe that they take over the meeting, correct? Uh, they can if they want, yes. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> the chair can uh, do the appointment for the committees. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, we're not, we're right going to remove, we were going to ask to remove. We're going to remove the committees, right? Because we yeah. already have one, yeah. we have one already set in place, correct? Uh, okay. we, we no longer have a separate HDC committees, so we were gonna remove that agenda item. Um, okay. So okay. The, go ahead the, and... Um... Yeah, so the, the bylaws say uh, that the chair and vice chair serve a one-year term with two-year consecutive term limits and uh, Director Ballesteros is at the end of her term. Uh, so she needs to be replaced and the vice chair is vacant. Uh, the HDC bylaws also say that the chair and vice chair shall not be the same for the Hackham Board of Commissioners, um, which is something you may want to change at some point in the future, um, but that's how the bylaws currently read. So the only eligible uh, directors for chair and vice chair are Director Gama, Director Goodwin, and Director Healy. Um, and so from a process standpoint, I will open the floor for nominations and you can nominate yourself or you can nominate someone else. And once we collect nominations, then we can proceed to a vote. Nominations do not require a second. Uh, so we can start with the position of vice chair. Are there any nominations for vice chair? I'll do it. Okay, Director Goodwin has been nominated for vice chair. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Nominations are closed. Nominations are open for the position of chair. I nominate um, Director Gama. Director Gama has been nominated. Are there any other nominations? And I nominate um, Director Healy. You certainly and then, can. Okay, and then see what he says, because I would have to decline. I have too much on my plate. I recently um, started the MSW program. That is fine. Uh, it's perfectly <laughs> acceptable to 
decline a nomination. Um, are there any other nominations? Congrats. Thank you. Nominations are closed. Um, Director Gama. So uh, historically, the board would vote by um, secret ballot. Um, this being a Zoom meeting, it seems like that is more difficult to do if the board wishes to vote by secret ballot. Um, you could all chat me privately or uh, we can vote publicly um, and we can vote as a slate or we can vote individually. It is up to the, the board. Um, I would, in the interest of time, move, move consideration for the slate of uh, Director Healy and Director Goodwin um, and just do a typical roll call if that meets with everybody's approval. That sounds great. Are there any objections? No. Okay, uh, we'll proceed to roll call. And this is for the slate of Chair Healy and Vice Chair Goodwin. Uh, Director Ballesteros. Yes. Director Peter. Yes. Director Gama. Yes. Director Goodwin. Yes. Director Healy and Director Wizard. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. So now we will, um, since the um, since the director um, is not here, um, Director Goodwin, do you want to take over the meeting? Honestly, I don't have the um, the agenda. Okay. I, okay. I I looked for it and um I in fact back the past two meetings I haven't been able to um ask him to get it. It's attached okay. to the agenda that Gabriela sent out. It's at the bottom of hers, Director Goodwin. It's being sent out as one attachment. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Silly me. Silly I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. So do you want me to go ahead and finish the meeting? Are Please. you okay with that? Okay. Please, you're doing great, as always. <laughs> okay, since we already uh, covered 6A in the previous meeting within the HACA meeting, we'll go ahead and consider that that was, we already uh, reviewed that. And we will go to director comments. And remember, we're, we're gonna go into the Tiny Village meeting right after. So um, starting with director um, Gama, any comments? I don't have any comments at this time. Thank you. Okay. Director Wizard? Uh, none. Thank you. Director Buter? <clears throat> yeah, um, I think we had talked about this maybe a few months ago, but I would, uh, I would suggest, and to make it not appear self-serving, I'm happy to like push it off for a year so that it's not self-serving, but I would suggest that going forward, we try to make whoever we pick for like board chair and vice chair of the housing authority, just be the same two people for HDC. I just feel like it streamlines communication and kind of everything. Um, so that's my, that's my two cents. Again, to make it not appear self-serving because I'm currently in one of those positions, um, I would just suggest that we put it on that, I guess that change to the bylaws, like that we could have a discussion about that maybe at the next meeting and we could make it, you know, a year from now, it could go into effect. Um, but that's, that's a su suggestion I have. Okay. Thank you, Director Buter. And Nora, if you can note that, please, to yes. remind. Um, it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, who was it? Oh, Director Goodwin. Um, I think uh, Director Buter had a really good idea um, to keep things um, coherent uh, and in line. But uh, anyway, thank you everybody um, for um, your uh, for nominating me as the vice, and um, I hope I can do a do it worthy. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for me to. Um... 
close the uh, director comments. I just want to say thank you to uh, Tori, Carolina, Nora, all the staff that's been working diligently and also to Jose. And um, I guess we'll close the meeting, this meeting at 746. And then we'll go to the time. The time in agenda is right at the end after the, uh, it's on page 27. Okay. So now we're gonna open up the Tynan Village Incorporated Annual Board Meeting. This meeting is held once a year, it's annual. And um, I'm calling this meeting to order. Tori, can you take roll call, please? Sure, uh, Director Ballesteros. Present. Director Booter. Present. Director Gama. Present. Director Goodwin. Present. Director Haley. Director Wizard. There are no comments, Director Bayaster. Are there are no comments from the public? Okay, thank you. So now the new business. Do Tori, do you know anything about this one? The election of officers? Is it gonna be the same? No, no. So the bylaws uh, for Tynan Village do not have a restriction as to who the uh, chair or vice chair can cannot be. Mm -hmm. um, it has the same restriction of uh, a two year term limit. Um, so uh, Director Ballesteros is not eligible, but all of the other directors are eligible. Okay. And do you know if it could be the same as the ones that were voted? They could be the same as HDC. They could be the same as Hackam. They could be different. Okay. So, what did uh, what did the other board um, directors feel? Hello. <laughs> Tori. Tori. Yes. They can't be the same as Hackam. It says the what? chair and the vice chair shall not be the same for the Hackam Board of Commissioners. It says that in the Tynan one as well? Yeah, I, I'm looking at it under okay. section 5.7, but it can be the same as HDC. Yeah, okay. So does um, this, do I remember that this board meets once annually? Yes, yeah. that's the only requirement. I mean, I think it's easy enough to just say that uh, the HDC officers do that. That they just be the same ones for tiny and correct? That's what yeah. it's okay. um, I mean, unless we want to develop like a more uh, structured formula where it's the two on, two on, two on, and we, everybody rotates. No. <laughs> but, yeah. then, but then we've got seven members and it just, it seems easier no. to just say, if you're HDC, you're also tiny. Correct. So do I have a motion for that? I move to do that. Maybe Francine okay. would not, but I'll and, do it. And, and okay. technically, I think we're we're making a nomination uh, for Director Healy and Director Goodwin. Yes. Okay. Do I have and a I'll second? I'll second that. Thank you. OK, roll call, please, Tori. Director Ballesteros. Yes. Director Booter. Yes. Director Gama. Yes. Director Goodwin. Yes. Director Healy and Director Wizard. Aye. Okay, so now it is 7.50 and I will close the Tynan Village Annual Meeting on October 24th and I guess we'll say goodbye. <laughs> Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Everybody. Good night. Appreciate good. it. Good night.